Hey guys, welcome back to TheClinicalTrialsGuru.com. Again, it's TheClinicalTrialsGuru.com. For those of you who are used to listening to me on iTunes or Stitcher, first of all, thank you. Second of all, I have not forgotten about you. I know I used to do these, these longer form podcasts and videos because you can go to YouTube to watch them too. Uh, about every week now, they're more like every other week. And that's because I've been listening to my audience. I've been getting audience member feedback. And the majority of people said, yes, we love your podcast and your longer form content. But what we really want is more of those short videos. So for those of you listening on iTunes and Stitcher uh, who are only consuming my content that way uh, and you want more of me because, let's face it, who doesn't, um, go to YouTube. Go to YouTube and subscribe and watch I do like two videos a day now, Monday through Friday, so that's 10 videos a week, uh, just about every week, and those are like five to seven minute videos where I answer uh, viewer questions, so you can cyber dust me, uh, but I'm, I haven't forgotten about you guys, and I'm still going to do the iTunes and the Stitcher longer form podcast, but it's going to be more like every other week, um, and actually, it, as a quick um, because I like to do a lot of free giveaways, and since Thanksgiving's coming up next week, for those of you watching in the future, right now it's November 20th, 2014, um, Thanksgiving's next week, so for the first three people right now, I don't care how you're hearing this or watching it or whatever, uh, if you're on iTunes, YouTube, wherever you may be, the first three people to email me, dan at theclinicaltrialsguru.com, and the subject line, the secret word is turkey. Turkey, as in gobble gobble for Thanksgiving. First three people to email me get one of my world famous follow up, follow up, follow up t shirts. Uh, just email me turkey and email me your gender, size, and send me a mailing address. And I'll send the first three people who reply to me with turkey in the subject line. They'll get a free gift because I love giving things away. So make sure you subscribe because you don't want to miss out on any of these things. And by the way, if you're watching and it's like five hours after this video has uploaded, you're probably too late. But if you're like an hour into it, you probably still have a chance. The first three, Dan at TheClinicalTrialsGuru.com. Anyways, wanted to get into this video and I'm using a new program right now to record, so I don't know if I'm going to have glitches. I've had glitches in the past with other programs, so I'm switching over. Uh, it's going to be all about principal investigators, okay? How to find them. How to pay them, how many do you need, how to use them to help you, how to use them to help you get more patients, more studies, how to use them to help you get other, other investigators, how to have them help you out for those inpatient studies that you need help with, uh, how do you partner with them, do you make them a business partner, uh, all these kind of things, it's going to kind of open up uh, in this longer form podcast, which is why I really like these longer form podcasts to begin with. So let's get right into it. The theme for today is going to be about principal investigators. Let's get right into it with a question. It says, hey Dan, uh, I recently have been tasked with recruiting new doctors for our research clinic. How detailed would I need to be to seek new PIs? So I'm assuming that how detailed you need to be means how thorough you need to look for a PI. What do you need to look for? Uh, we'll, I'll just cover everything because I think it's a great segue into everything else I plan to talk about today. So, first you want to look at your clinic right now. Are you a multi-therapeutic clinic? Are you a clinic that only conducts one type of clinical trials? Meaning, are you focused on a specific specialty, medical specialty, therapeutic indication? Or are you multi-therapeutic? Okay, that's going to let you know what kind of doctors you're going to need to look for. Do you need a specialist? Do you need a regular family practice, general medicine doctor? And by the way, right now it's 2014, going into 2015. The future of clinical trials is going to be specialization, specialization, specialization. Meaning, sponsors are now going to want specialists to conduct either certain procedures or be in charge of the overall trial, meaning as a PI, if it's a if it, the clinical trial is for a their particular therapeutic indication that would require a specialist. Now that doesn't mean that a family practitioner or a general medicine doctor 
or an ER doctor, because the, the, some of these doctors in the ER, they're the first line of defense for a wide variety of different diseases and medical conditions. So they have experience over a diverse range of medical conditions. So an ER doctor, as a side note, emergency room doctor is a great place to start. Uh, but specialization is going to be the key going forward. Now, that doesn't mean that your general practitioner cannot be a PI. What that means is that your general practitioner can be a PI, especially if he or she has a lot of experience, even over a diverse range of trials, as long as he or she has a sub-I who is a specialist. Uh, so a perfect example of this is a study I'm currently working on for, uh, I'm wondering if I can say it, uh, it's for an arthritis study, okay, and I'll leave it at that. The sponsor's requesting, requiring, I should say, uh, but they are also kindly requesting uh, that either the PI or the sub-I be a rheumatologist. These are people who specialize in arthritis, okay, because the study drug is going to require some real oversight by a rheumatologist. Um, that doesn't mean the PI has to be a rheumatologist, but it means the PI should, if the PI is not a rheumatologist, the PI should have a rheumatologist as a sub-I. So... Think of that strategy when you're, you know, reverse engineering your clinic to see what you actually need versus what you have, and then go out and look for those MDs or DOs that you need. Um, also, look at projections from your site. What kind of studies do you have in your pipeline? What kind of studies has your clinic done well on in the past that you would expect to continue doing well on in the future? What kind of new specialization trials are you seeing? Are you seeing more cancer trials? Are you seeing a lot of diabetes studies? What are you seeing? What are the trends? And this could be anything. I mean, you know your specific niche better than anyone else. At least I would hope you would do. Uh, so you really need to be proactive in this and reverse engineer the entire thing and look at what you have versus what you think you'll need. And a lot of it is making um, educated guesses or gambles. Like, are you all in on a rheumatologist? Or do you believe that asthma is going to be strong, therefore you're going for a pulmonologist? Um, so reverse engineer your clinic, figure out what you need. Once you figure out what you need, how do you go out and get doctors? Okay, How do you go out and get PIs? I don't have the actual stats in front of me, but a ridiculous, an absurd amount of, P of MDs have never conducted research. The vast majority of them, almost, I would say 90%, maybe even more than 90%, of MDs have never done clinical research. So a lot of these doctors would actually probably like doing clinical trials. They just have never been given the opportunity to do it. So see this as your opportunity for going out there and introducing not only your company to these doctors who have never done clinical research, but introducing being the ambassador for the clinical research industry in general. Okay, uh, just in its entirety. You are, think of yourself as the ambassador to clinical research, to all these MDs who may be interested in conducting clinical trials but don't know the very first thing about how to go about doing it. And that's where you come in. And you've really got to think like an entrepreneur, like a salesperson, like someone who's actually giving, providing value, not just taking away someone's time or wasting their time with a lunch or coffee because these doctors can buy lunch for themselves. They can buy coffee for themselves. What they really want is value from you, and if you really take on that, adopt this notion that you're the ambassador to clinical research for all these doctors, I think that's a good one. That might be a next t-shirt, um, an ambassador to clinical research. I like that, and none of these podcasts are scripted, by the way. I just kind of freestyle the entire thing. Um, I don't do, embarrassingly, any preparation when it comes to these podcast, videos, even when I interview other people, um, maybe it shows, but uh, I just, that's not how I roll, because I'm actually involved in this industry, so during the day, during the times that I'm not actually making these videos or these podcasts, I'm actually doing clinical research work myself, but I digress. So how do you find doctors? you got to go out there, there's so many different ways to do this, there's a thousand different ways, like the cliche says, to skin a cat. I, I break it down to two ways. Traditional door knocking 
and then online. So let's go to traditional door knocking. The best bet, don't cold call anybody. You're never going to get past the gatekeeper. Go door knocking. Go to a medical building or go to a hospital. Go someplace where there's tons of doctors. A medical building next to a hospital is perfect. And just go door to door to every single doctor. Bring a brochure. So for those of you who are not are not designers, I understand we're not graphic designers, go to fiverr.com, that's F-I-V-E-R-R, -R, and for five bucks you can get a ridiculously nice brochure made that explains what clinical research is, um, what your company is about, what kind of studies your organization is doing, what you're looking for in a PI or an MD, explain to them what a PI even is, because they're probably not going to know. Um, and it helps, okay, no one wants to be the first of anything, so just like sponsors never want to be the first sponsor to give you a study, no MD is going to want to be the first MD to work with you. So it sounds like in your case, the original viewer's question was how do they uh, get more MDs? So it sounds like you already have some. So. You may or may not be allowed to put their names on it, check with your manager or your boss, but you can at least put what kind of MDs you work with, what specialties, what are their specialties, how long have they been doing it, um, how many trials are they doing, what are they doing, what are some of their responsibilities. Uh, because a very powerful psychological human trigger that I learned from a great book you all should read by Robert Caldini, I believe it's called Influence. That's influence. I believe the sixth psychological trigger, if I'm not mistaken, is social proof. Okay, so if a doctor, it's much easier to convince that doctor to join you and to do studies with you if he or she sees that other doctors, some of their colleagues maybe, are doing studies with you. Okay, so, and, and then once you find that first PI, once you find that first investigator, it becomes infinitely easier to find the next one, the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth because of this social proof. So you got to sell the heck out of that social proof phenomenon. It works like crazy. I mean, look at YouTube as a perfect example. You're not going to subscribe to some somebody's channel who only has like four subscribers. But if you go to someone's channel who has like 400, you're going to subscribe because that's social proof. It means that many people can't be wrong. And we know that's not true. That many people can be wrong, but it's just one of those powerful psychological triggers. So social proof is big. Go to Fiverr.com, get somebody for five bucks to design a nice brochure for you. They're not going to write the brochure. They, these people, these are designers. They don't know what clinical research is either. So you're going to have to write what goes on the brochure, but they're just going to make it look nice and look professional and make it look like you didn't do it yourself on Microsoft Word or something. Okay, so that's... That's how you go door knocking, and then just go door knocking, go crazy, go go, just keep knocking on people's doors. If they tell you no, go to the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and just keep following up. Understand what specialties you need, okay? Don't waste your time with specialists that you're not going to be doing studies for. Uh, so don't waste, like, three weeks trying to find a gastroenterologist, and then you're not going to do any GI trials. So know what you need, and then go out and get it. Um, another way to get physicians to join you is online and one of my favorite ways it's brand new I'm still tinkering with this every day is LinkedIn ads so LinkedIn is now letting you create an ad uh, that and target only specific job titles within a specific geographic area so let's say I have a clinic in Baltimore Maryland which I actually do all right and I'm looking for PIs in that area I can go on LinkedIn ads, create an ad, and target MDs and DOs and even principal investigators, but that might be a little too narrow of a search result. So I would open it up to MDs and DOs in the area, and you can do within like a 20 mile radius, 30 mile radius, whatever it is. And this ad will show up in these doctors' streams, and you only get charged when they click on it, and it's usually like two to five bucks a click. So the idea, the strategy here is to get this to be a clickable piece of content. So something that a doctor's not just going to scroll over because this is going to show up in their news feed. 
Okay, so it can't look like an ad. It's got to look like something that's interesting to them. Maybe a nice article or something. Figure out what a doctor, what a particular specialist is interested in. And, I mean, find a way to get a piece of content out there. Brainstorm with maybe some other doctors that you know or somebody from your clinic on what they'd be interested in. Okay, and then do that. I'm currently working with a few clients. My um, clinical trial guru consulting firm where we do a lot of online media, a lot of online advertising. I'm currently working with a couple clients of mine and they're not looking for new doctors but they're looking for new studies. So I'm targeting project managers and medical monitors for different studies. So I'm always constantly tweaking these ads to see what gets people to click on what. I'm really big in like psychology and what makes people um, do certain actions or take certain uh, actions. That's what I'm interested in. <clears throat> so those are the two ways to find a PI, the offline and the online. Now, how many PIs do you need? Again, it all depends on what size your clinic is um, and what kind of indications you're getting. So let's say you have a really good family practice PI who's been a PI with your clinic for like 20 years. But you understand now that sponsors are getting more, are requiring specialists. So maybe you need some specialist to join your group as sub eyes. Or maybe they can be the PIs and your family practice guy can be the sub eye. So understand how many you need, what pieces you need to put this puzzle together. As a general rule, for every 10 studies you have, you want two or three MDs. So you want one PI and then the other two to be backups. Oftentimes these protocols need blinded MDs, unblinded MDs. So you need two or three investigators, MDs, for every 10 trials. So if you have 30 trials, do the math, okay? So if you have 10 trials, you need two or three MDs, and they can alternate as to who's the sub I and who's the PI, and then they can back each other up when they're sick, when they're on vacation, when they're at conferences when they're at investigator meetings, whatever it is, when they're at a kid's soccer game, you have you always have the coverage in place. <clears throat> um, so that's so once you know the specialties and how many you need, let's say you found them, right? You found everyone you need. Now you're gonna figure out how to pay them. Okay. One way to go about it, if you're in the this is more so the case for the startups out there, the clinics that are just getting started. You may want to offer equity. Let's say you find an MD who's really business oriented and is all for it, all for helping you out and wants to help you build a nice profitable research company. You may want to offer him equity anywhere from 20 to 50 percent. And I know that might sound like a lot, but if this person's going to be helping you get patients, doing all the studies for you, helping you recruit sub investigators or other specialists so that you can diversify your brand's portfolio and do provide more studies uh, uh, across the across different therapeutic indications. It may be worth giving 20 to 50 percent equity. I've actually partnered with some PIs in other other states because I can't physically be in these states like Texas or Florida. I've partnered 2080 where I'm getting 20 percent. Basically, I'm getting the contracts. I'm getting the studies. I'm negotiating the contracts, I'm helping with the online recruitment, and then the PI's got 80% equity in the company, and they're doing the day-to-day -day tasks, and I'm, I also come in and do QA, quality assurance, all those different kind of things. Um, I actually have another startup where I'm training people who want to be CRAs on how to be CRAs, so a lot of times I can send a CRA to do some QA at a site. Um, so oftentimes the PIs uh, like that arrangement. So uh, if you're interested in partnering with me, let me know. I do these kind of things all the time. Uh, again, I'm trying to buy the LA Clippers. That's my goal, a uh, 30 year goal. So uh, as far as how to partner with the PI, so you can go anywhere from 20% to 50% to 80%, whatever makes sense for you. If you're going to be hands on as well, I would not give up more than 50% of your own equity because it sounds like this is like your business and your career and your primary means of income as well. So don't give up more than 
if you're an act if you're going to be actively involved if you're going to be passively involved like I am in some of my situations then you can give up more than half of the equity um, if you don't want to give equity let's say you're not sure that this PI is the right fit but you still want to use him to get studies but not necessarily make him or her a business partner just yet um, pay them as an independent contractor and don't let the IRS scare you right I got an email the other day from someone I did a video on YouTube where the IRS said that they could not make a PI an independent contractor because technically they're following a protocol and they're following SOPs. This is all nonsense. It's all baloney. Okay, tell the IRS that your PI, there's no way you as a non-clinician can tell your PI what to do when it comes to conducting a clinical trial. You have no clinical expertise yourself. You cannot instruct a doctor on how they need to do their job, okay? Second of all, you're not, these PIs, they don't have a set schedule where they have to be at your clinic from 9 to 5, okay? These guys are doing other things. They're working in ERs. They have their own private practice. There's no way that they could be a full-time employee of for you even if you wanted them to be. So tell the IRS this is complete nonsense, all right? So independent contractor is the way to go where you're not giving up equity, but you're paying them a percentage of the check that you get from the drug company. So let's say one month you got ten grand, a $10,000 check. If you're paying the PI 10% as an independent contractor, you take that check, you make a copy of it, it's ten grand. you give the PI a copy, and you say we agreed to 10%, so here's your 1000 for this month, for this study. Now if you have ten studies, all paying roughly the same, he just made 10 grand that month for maybe 10 hours of work or however long it took. So you see you see the uh, you see the opportunities here. One study is not necessarily looking that attractive, but once you compound them, you get like 10 studies for a PI at 10% each and you're enrolling a good amount. They can make 10 grand uh, and that's not bad for a second stream or third stream of income for some of these these investigators so that's how I would arrange the compensation with the PI now PIs can often be a great resource for you not only in the social proof so recruiting other doctors for you um, which we've talked about but also for finding patients so if you find a PI who has a huge private practice I mean, you're pretty much sitting on top of a gold mine because you, you can tell your PI exactly what kind of patients you need. Your PI is going to know exactly what kind of patients you need for your trial. So he's going to be willing to help you out there as well. And that's another thing to consider when proposing a partnership or just the independent contractor relationship with the PIs. How experienced is he? How many patients does he have? Is he a really a good fit to be a partner, or do you want to keep him as an independent contractor? Um, and then you, you want to build up their CVs. So as soon as you get a study for him, let's say okay, let's say you find an MD who has zero research experience, um, but wants to very much be a PI, and hopefully, ideally, you already have an MD at your site. So bring this MD on board as a sub I immediately add those studies that he's a sub I on on his CV and if you've got like a mid small to mid sized clinic even instantly you can they can have five studies on their CV as an investigator so when you go pitch to a sponsor for that person to be a PI their CV doesn't have any any uh, zero research experience on it it has already like five to ten studies so that's how you build up a MDs CV very quickly with someone who has zero research experience um, and almost instantly give them a good amount of research experience uh, but make sure that they're actually a sub I and actually understanding what studies they're on and understand the idea and uh, best practices GCP and all that stuff and by the way you're gonna have to do GCP um, with these guys, teach them how to do it. Teach them how to do it regularly and on, on an ongoing basis. Um, I believe it's once a year that you should have GCP, and sometimes each protocol requires a separate GCP training for these PIs. So 
that's that. Uh, what was the other question? So we found out how to find them. We found out how to reverse engineer uh, what you what your clinic need versus what you have. And then I, I taught you how to go out and get them, uh, how to pay them, how to partner with them, how to help them find new doctors, how to have them help you find patients. A lot of times these doctors are also speakers for drug companies. Um, and this would have very little to do with the research except for the fact that they're prob they probably have a good relationship if they are indeed a speaker. They probably have a good relationship with the pharmaceutical liaison for a particular drug company. And that pharmaceutical liaison is exactly what the title says, is a liaison between the sales team of that drug company and the research and development team. So that's a perfect person for your PI uh, to you establish a relationship with and from there you can piggyback off of that relationship and get studies for your clinic from the PI um, because of his or her relationship with that medical liaison so now you know how to get studies even from your MDs and I think I pretty much went through most of these viewer questions um, I may be missing a few here I apologize but we're already going on 26 minutes and to tell you the truth, my throat's getting sore. I've been under the weather a little bit. But I want to give my clinical trial guru producers a shout out. And remember, turkey is the secret word, okay? Only three. I got three shirts to give away. So here's my clinical trial guru producers, all right? Sarah Elizabeth Siegler, Resolve Research Solutions, Accurate Clinical Trials, PTNR, Erdhart Clinical Research, Tradestone LLC, Breakthrough Clinical Trials, Cool Carney Law Firm, Biofarm Systems, Simewire, Mozio, St. Paul Medical Research Center, Investigators Research Group LLC, Phlebotomy Services, Atria Clinical Research Management, Rheumatic Disease Clinical Research Center, Clinexus Research LLC, Coastal Connecticut Research LLC. If you'd like to be a clinical trial guru producer, let me know. Uh, it's $99 for basically a lifetime membership. What that gives you is a link on my website under the producers page and mentioned in every long form video like you just heard every interview and occasionally some of the shorter length videos that I think are gonna be popular and get a lot of views because I wanna help promote you guys too okay so again thanks for listening thanks for watching secret word is turkey send it to Dan at the clinical trials guru .com. subscribe everywhere to the blog to youtube to itunes to stitcher everywhere add me on every social network let's talk uh, i want to help you out i want to help as many people out as possible because i really believe in giving so that you can get back and i'm no mother Teresa. like i said i want to buy the clippers so i want to give as much as i can give as much value so that i can get back in return okay Thank you for watching. Dan from TheClinicalTrialsGuru.com. Take care.